as I was preparing for this message, I thought to myself, since everybody has, look, Roger, Roger's got a Kindle fire. And he's got a couple of iPhones. But he likes his little flip phone. But as I thought about this and as I sent this uh, message to Annette to type out, all the verses that I'm going to talk about, 90% of them is going to be in your bulletin. So you need to put your glasses on, turn your electronics off, unless you're a doctor or a nurse or somebody's looking for you. You can leave it on. And as I, I walk you through what uh, I've prepared here, I, I want you to hear what I'm going to say. And as, as God has intervened with me through the Holy Spirit this past week, I've changed what I'm going to say three or four times. For any of those of, uh, that's preached before or had a Sunday school class and you're getting ready for it, you know that as you start preparing for it, things come to mind. The Holy Spirit opens your mind and your hearts to different things. And I want to start off with something that's unusual. It is said on one occasion a, a young man to, came to a great public speaker. He, he wanted to learn how to be as good as this public speaker was. But as a young man came in for the first meeting, he started talking and talking and talking. And, and finally, finally the teacher says, I can't get a word in edgewise. Stop. So the young man stopped and he says, young man, I'm going to have to charge you a double prize. And this young student says, why in the world would you char charge me uh, for public speaking two times? He says, well, first, I'm going to have to hold your tongue before I show you how to use your tongue. Pretty good advice, wasn't it? And we all know people that seem to, once I get to talking, you, you know, sometimes in there, you just, it's too much. And, uh, you know, the career that I had, I heard housewives most of my life. I ran supermarkets. And so these housewives would come in and start talking. I guess they expected me to stand here like I didn't have anything to do and hear all these stories. And the hardest thing to do was to cut people off from what they're trying to say. You know, you want to get, get them to the point. And, and as, as uh, I sat down uh, last Sunday afternoon and, and I thought about the trials of life and what's next. Do you ever think about what's next? Do you ever think about that? And in your, in your bulletin, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. How true that is. And the second verse I have on there is 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried by the Holy Spirit. Are we carried by the Holy Spirit? When you sit down and read your Bible and you think of the different things that you read, do, do you let God speak to you as, as those are happening? Do we see trials as pure joy? That's a hard call, isn't it? We all go through hardships and situations that seem hard and, and at times we pray to get through them as fast as they get started. You ever get into something and you think, oh, God, I wish this would end. You know, and we've all been in situations where you think, oh, how long is this going to go on? And then eventually it goes away and years later you think back to yourself, man, that was, that's how long it took. But when you're in the middle of it, it's very stressful. But we know it doesn't happen like that. Do we as Christians have enough faith that we can share our joy of going through hardships with others? Does your best friend call you and say, oh man, I'm speaking to the young group. My boyfriend is going out with another girl. That's a hardship, believe it or not. Or... I didn't get picked on the team to play basketball this year. That's a hardship. And at your work, the guy next to you that you thought never did a thing, he got promoted and you didn't. That's a trial. What are you going to do? And as, as you go through your daily lives, those trials and tribulations, they just keep coming. They just keep coming. 
and, and we're, we're not going to get out of it. The different ministries that I'm in, uh, I do a promise keepers group, and, and we, we lift our praises and prayer requests to each other, and then we pray over them. The Sunday school class and the G2 group I'm in, we lift our praises and the prayer requests, and you all see those as, as they're sent out on the church prayer request. And then I'm also a Gideon, and we meet every week, and we raise our praises and prayer requests uh, to each other, and we pray for this church, and we pray for all the churches in the city, and we pray for the pastors. And, and it's something that as you get in your groups and as you live your daily lives, are people aware of the trials and tribulations that you go through? In uh, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, it says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, or greater worth than gold, which perishes even through refined by fire, be proved genuine, and may result in praise and glory to honor Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ is revealed. Do you think of those kind of things? In James, verse 3 and 4, it says, Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must first finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. Testing is finding proof. When we take a test or when we are tested, it shows us that we know or understand what is asked of us or what we can handle or withstand the pressure of a trial. When I was in high school and I was taking uh, geometry and trigonometry and all of this stuff, I always thought to myself, the guy next to me has no clue what's happening. And most of the time he didn't because I sat in the class with him, so I knew what. And I always tried to help him, and, and he never did want anybody to help him. And how he got through the class, I don't know. But we all know people that when you go through a trial, you just you, you sort of want to run and hide and get away from it but it's going to continue to come. Patience or perseverance can, can help us go through the trials and the tests we face in our lives. From these we receive durability as well as maturity. Paulo Crelo said this, the two hardest tests in the spiritual road are the patience to wait for the right moment and the courage not to be disappointed with what we encounter. A lot of truth in that, isn't there? And, and Ashley Spear says, Depression weighs you down like a rock in a river. You don't stand a chance. You can fight and pray and hope you have the strength to swim. But sometimes you have to let yourself sink because you'll never know true happiness until someone or something pulls you back out of that river and you'll never believe it until you realize it was you, yourself, that saved you. You did it. And it's hard to believe because you had the courage and the ability to, to pull yourself up and out. David Jeremiah says Christians cannot develop to maturity or fullness or wholeness without going through trials in their lives. You can't reach it. We're going to be tested and trialed all the way up until the day that we leave this earth. John MacArthur says, The testing of your faith drives believers to deeper communion and greater trust in Christ. Qualities that in turn produce a stable, godly, and righteous character. Hebrews 10.36 in your bulletin. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. The Bible's full of promises. But if you can persevere and get through it, you will be better for it. You'll be a stronger person. Your character will be stronger. In 1 Peter 5.10, Peter says, And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. 
God does that for you. In James 1, verses 5 and 6, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given him. But when he asks, when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubt is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. When you pray for something in your mind, do you know it's going to get done? Do you think it's going to get done? Do you hope it's going to get done? Or do you just pray to pray? When I pray for someone to be healed, I know in my mind that if it is the will of God, that person will get better. And we all should think that as, as we're going through our lives. Because all of us know people that are sick. We know people that are terminal. We, and, and as your life goes on, you're going to be surrounded with it the, the rest of the rest of your life. Those with wisdom know what to do in the midst of confusing circumstances. A clarity that only God can give. And, and this is not in your bulletins, but James 3.17 says, But wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere. If you ask God, He will send it to you in that form. But first, you have to believe. But one of, one of that, uh, but one that He will provide without reproof if His children only ask. In your bulletin, Proverbs 3, 6 through 8. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless. For He guards the course of the just and protects the way of the faithful. This command, ask of God, is a necessary part of the believer's prayer life. God intends that trials will drive believers to greater dependency on Him by showing them their own inadequacies. As with all His riches, God has wisdom in abundance available for those who just seek it. Philippians 4, verse 19, And my God will meet all the needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. It was uh, Proverbs uh, uh, 3, 5, and 6 is not in your bulletin. It was something that I added on after this was set up. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. We've all heard that. We've all read that. Now we're going to jump back into the Old Testament with Isaiah 41, 13. I don't think that's in your bulletin either. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. 2 Corinthians 12, 2, or 12, 10. For the, for the sake of Christ, then I am con, uh, content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And we've all heard that. But as, as, you, as you think about what's next and the trials of your life, where does your mind and your thoughts go? Because I don't know what all of y'all are going to do tomorrow, but that's what's next. I don't know what you're going to do after I step off here. That's what's next. I don't know where you're going to go on vacation, but that's next. All of this is next. James 1, verses 7 and 8. The man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The double-minded person is spiritually conflicted and therefore unsettled in all his ways. True faith produces people who are stable. Produces people who are stable, looking only to God for the wisdom they need, and He, he will respond 
James 4, 8, and I think that may be in your bulletin there. Come near to God and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded people. You ever known anybody that says they're a Christian and then, and then you, you see them doing something and you think, oh man, you should never be doing something like that. But we've all been in situations where we do things that we're not knowing we're doing that is a sin. Those, those are sins that, are, that you have to pray that, Lord, you know, uh, maybe I spoke out of turn. Maybe I did something wrong. I said something to someone that offended them. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness for those kind of things. But that also brings up another trial. And it also brings up what's next. Maybe that person ain't going to call you anymore. They're not going to Facebook you anymore. They drop you off. Those things happen. Jumping to James 1, 9 through 11. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blooms and blossoms falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Trials make all the believers equal and dependent on God and bringing them to the same level with each other by keeping them from becoming preoccupied with earthly things. Do we get preoccupied with earthly things? Boy, I do. I'll get to doing something and, and God and Jesus Christ is the last thing on my mind. And then as you go down the road, you think, golly, if I would have prayed about this before I got into it, it would have probably been a little easier than what I just went through. So those times come. Poor Christians and wealthy ones rejoice that God is no respecter of persons and that they both have the privilege of being identified with Christ. God in Christ knows your name. They know your name. The grass withers and the flowers fall is a natural illustration how divinely wroth death and judgment can quickly end the, the wealthy person's dependence on material possessions. Proverbs 27, 24. For the riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secured for all generations. I knew a guy that uh, had a gun collection that, that he thought was the best there ever was, and he had a good gun collection. And... Uh, he had a nice coin collection. He, he, he's a member of this church, and he's not here today. That's why I can talk about him. <laughs> but, but he took a vacation, and he was gone for a couple of months. And when he came back, someone had opened up his garage and gone into his house and taken his entire safe. Took the entire safe out of his, out of his house. And, and I heard about it well, a month or so afterwards, and, and he called the insurance company, and, and they would replace you know, the, the pistols and the rifles because he, he had identified them, but they would not replace the value of the coin collection other than face value. You know, if he had a, if he had a $50 gold piece, he got $50 for it. And the insurance company paid him for that. And he had a list of everything he had. And he said, sir, we can't do that. This is what you're going to get. Now, I want you to think about that. Because he thought an awful lot about that and now he doesn't have it, and, and I see a load coming off from him. He don't have to worry about all that stuff because it's gone. His coin collection's gone. His rifles and stuff are gone. His pistols are gone. And, and he seems like, well, it's just one of those things. And he's at an age where I don't think he's going to start collecting rifles and pistols and coins anymore. But, but anyway, it's, uh, it's one of those trials and situations that you go through. Because if you have a hobby that takes your time away from other things, something's wrong with that situation. In Romans 8.35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, uh, persecution or famine, or, or nakedness or danger or sword? God has given us His Word to guide us, His Holy Spirit to enable us, and the privilege of coming to Him any time, like Steve said earlier today, you can go to God any time, any place, 
and pray about anything, He has also assured us that no trial will test us beyond our ability to bear it. And He will also provide a way so that you can stand under it or a way out. You ever been in a circumstance you thought, oh, I'm not supposed to be here. Now you've got to make a decision. When, uh, when I worked for Safeway Stores in corporate, uh, we would have our meetings in uh, El Paso, Texas, and all the guys wanted to go into Mexico and drink and party and have a great time. That was hard to turn down, fellas. First year or two, I didn't turn it down. And then as time went on, I started turning it down. But, but we all are confronted with situations where you have to make a decision on what you're going to do. In John 14, 15 through 31, it says, Jesus promises believers comfort from five supernatural blessings that the world does not enjoy. Supernatural helper. God will help you whenever you need it. All you got to do is ask. A supernatural life. Hey, we're blessed. We're doing okay. Third, a supernatural union. We're among believers and friends. We live in a nice place. Number four, a supernatural teacher. Here's the Word of God right here. Teach you everything that you need to know about this life. And uh, fifth, a supernatural peace. How many of y'all go to bed worrying about what's going to happen? You're worried about your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your uncle, your cousin, your job, uh, uh, whatever. Worry is hard on you. Uh, I used to worry about things, but when I, go to, when I lay down now, I'm history. I, I, don't, I don't really worry about a lot of things. But I pray that y'all don't either. The key to all of this is verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. Which relates that these supernatural promises are for those who love Jesus Christ. Whose love is, uh, is evident by, by uh, uh, obedience. As Paul was given through trials of all sorts. From beatings, put in prison, shipwrecked. And just all the things that he went to. He was able to look back without any regard or remorse. Because remember what Paul said. All y'all can remember that. And, and as Paul lived his life, and as he's written most of the New Testament here, I look back at when, when Jesus blinded him and, and put him on the right path and asked him why he was persecuting him. And then for three years he taught Paul what he needed to do. And as Paul started out into the Gentile world, everybody thought Paul was the person that was going to, to persecute all the people that believed in Jesus Christ. We live in a world like that today. A lot of people you know and I know, they don't believe that Jesus Christ was resurrected. They don't believe he was born of a virgin. They don't believe that he was raised and he sits in, in heaven with God. He don't believe that God was the Father. He don't believe that, a lot of them don't believe that when Jesus left that you have the Holy Spirit when all you have to do is, is do the ABCs. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. B, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that he was born of a virgin and that he was, he was crucified on the cross and he was raised. And C, that you confessed your sins to him. You're a Christian. Now I follow in his footsteps. And I guarantee it's not going to be easy. For all of those that have come to Christ, you know, the first week or two, you know, it sort of is not there. It, it just sort of, it's, it's sort of gone. And then, and then somewhere it starts, it starts kicking back in. Trials are part of what God is doing to prepare his people for his blessings. The person who remains faithful to, to the end will receive the crown of life. God purposes trials to occur, and in them, He allows temptation to happen. You ever been in a situation where there's a trial and then there's a temptation? Oh, man, look at that chocolate pie over there. I can eat half of it. Well, I personally could. <laughs> but He has promised not to allow more than believers can endure, and we talked about that uh, earlier. But uh, believers can endure and never without a way to escape. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I think it's in there. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. What's common to man? 
Think of that a minute. What is common to man? In your everyday life, there are temptations that are common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up on it. And we talked about that also. Just as animals can be drawn to their deaths by attractive baits, and for those of y'all that uh, hunt and do different things, temptation promises people something good which is actually harmful. His own desires, this refers to lust, the strong desire of the human soul to enjoy or acquire something to fulfill the flesh. What is your flesh? Every one of us in this room have five senses. You see, you smell, you hear, you taste, and you feel. All of those are your senses. Man's fallen nature has the propensity to strongly desire whatever sin will fill and satisfy it. His own desires and individual natures of lust, it is different for each person as a result of inherent tendencies, environment, upbringing, personal choices. None of y'all were raised like I was raised. How many of y'all's dads was uh, a policeman? My dad was a policeman. How many of y'all lived in New Mexico in 1960? See? I was, raised, uh, I was raised there and graduated high school in 1968 in Hobbs, New Mexico. Hobbs, New Mexico is known for Texaco oil men learning how to work on oil derricks. And oil derricks is pumping oil out of the ground that's refined and puts in your car. That's where some of that comes from. But anyway, all our needs are different based off how, how you were raised. In Proverbs 19, 3, it says, A man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against God or the Lord. Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. If you're a Christian, once you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your eternity just started. You won't see the second death, but you will see the first death. The, the first death was your sin was, was taken away from you. The second death, you'll die, and then you'll be with heaven. You'll be with Jesus Christ and God in heaven. Yielding to temptation is sin. Temptation itself is not a sin. Temptation is also not just a single event, but a process involving four stages. The enticement, the entrapment, the endorsement, and then the enslavement. The key to overcoming temptation is not just to resist, but also to change one's thoughts Focusing one's mind on what is true and on the one who assures victory. Jesus has beat death. He's beat the devil. He's already done that for you and he's, and he's done it for, for myself. James 1 verse 15. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And that's what James is, is telling the, uh, the Jewish people in the synagogue in, in Jerusalem as, as he's talking about that in 1 James. Psalm 31, 19. How great is our goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestowed in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. Sin is not merely a spontaneous act but the result of a process. We talked about one process. The temptation has three stages. It has a desire, it has a sin, and it has a death. And we talked about the death. While sin does not result in spiritual death for the believer, 
it can lead to physical death. Temptation is inevitable. No one escapes it. Everybody in this room is going to be, going to be put through trials and temptation. You're not going to get around it. Temptation is in inevitable. No one escapes it. No one, not even Christ. Remember when Christ was tempted by the devil? Unless believers acknowledge this reality, they have programmed themselves for failure. The key to overcoming temptation is not just to resist, but also to change one's thoughts, refocusing one's mind on what is true and on the one who assures victory. And we, we, we've talked about that. In James 16... Verse 18, it says, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that He might be the kind of first fruits of all He created. You know, when God created the earth, Jesus was standing right there and He watched it. And as time went on, as Jesus was, was born to a virgin, and, and as he grew up, uh, I don't know how old James was, but James was a brother of Jesus. I don't know how much he knew of Jesus up until Jesus' ministry started at the age of 30. But as James, James did not believe at the time that his brother Jesus Christ was Christ Jesus, the Savior, until Christ was crucified, and once he was raised, his brother his mind was opened up and he realized that Jesus Christ was the Savior and was sent by God to save every one of us and everybody on this planet. Do not be deceived, Christians. Christians are not to make the mistake of blaming God rather than themselves for their sin. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Psalm 31, 19. I may have read that, but we're going to read it again. How great is our goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of man on those who take refuge in you. John 3, 7, John 3, 27. To this John replied, A man can receive only what is given to him from heaven. Think of that. James 4 7 through 8. Casey will be talking about that in the upcoming couple of weeks. He's, I think he's in uh, chapter 4 of James, not sure. Submit yourselves. Then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Chris Hodges says, Paul was focusing on what was happening in him, not to him. Likewise, we cannot be sure that when something is happening to us, God is doing something in us. Something that will shape us for eternity. George Foster said, Our character is being forged on an anvil of the different experiences we are facing. We know that if we remain committed to God's purpose for us, we would be prepared to face the future. That was a good saying. On the bottom of your sheets there, there's a saying that I, I run across a long time ago. And it, it just hits just right here. It's on a, on a book that I read in a Sunday school class in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1980-something. Charles Spurgeon said, and I want you all to remember this because you can use this saying in your daily life. The child of God works not for life, but from life. He does not work to be saved. He works because he is saved. Powerful saying, isn't it? Why does God allow us to go through trials and tribulations? One of the most difficult parts of the Christian life is the fact that becoming a, dis a disciple of Christ does not make us immune to life's trials. I'd look to see what time it was. I didn't want to go over. Why would a good and loving God allow us to go through such things as the death of a child, the disease and injury 
to ourselves and our loved ones, financial hardships, worry and fear. Surely, if He loved us, He would take all of these things away from us. After all, doesn't loving us mean He wants our lives to be easy and comfortable? Well, no, it doesn't. The Bible clearly teaches that God loves those who are His children, and He works all things together for good. For us, so that, and this is Romans 8, 28, most of you all know this by heart, so that, so that must mean that the trials and tribulations uh, He allows in our lives are part of the working together of all things. Therefore, for the believer, all trials and tribulations must be a divine purpose. Back to Romans 8, 28, quote, works all things together for the good of us. So when something bad is happening, do you think it's bad or do you think that God slowed you down for some reason? No clue. As in all things, God's ultimate purpose for us is to grow more and more into the image of His Son. This is the goal of a Christian and everything in life, including the trials and tribulations, is designed to enable us to reach that goal. It is part of the process of sanctification being set apart for God's purpose and fitted to live for His glory. The way trials accomplish this is explained in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. And I'll reread it. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your, the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which perishes even through tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor in the revelation of Jesus Christ. The true believer's faith will be made sure by the trials we experience so that we can rest in knowledge that it is real and that it lasts forever. However, we must never make excuses for our trials and tribulations if they are a result of our own doing and our own wrongdoing. By no means let any of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. God will forgive our sins because the eternal punishment, the eternal punishment for them has been paid for by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. However, we still have to suffer the natural consequences in this life for our sins and bad choices. But God uses even those suffering to mold and shape us to His purpose and for His ultimate good. So everything that you do, God already knows you're going to do it. What you're thinking, God already knows what you're thinking. And the things that you do, God already knows you're going to do them. Then you have a, have a choice to make. Are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? We've all had circumstances where you, 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 you're looking at something that you know that you can help. But you know, you just don't have the time to do it right now. And, and, and those are the times where, you know, something may be more important than what's in front of you. But if you have the opportunity and you feel the Holy Spirit pushing you to it, I encourage you to do it. And it may be a trial, it may be a tribulation, it may be something that you don't want to get involved in. But take the chance. Through all of life's trials and tribulations, we have the victory. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Although we are, a spirit, we are in a spiritual battle, Satan has no authority over the believer in Christ. God has given us His Word to guide us, His Holy Spirit to enable us, and the privilege of coming to Him anywhere at any time to pray about anything he has also assured us that no trial or test will go beyond your ability and that you can withstand it and there will always be a way out. Back to the first verse that I read to y'all. It says 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. 2 Peter 1.20.21 Above all, you must understand that no prophecy or scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but man spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And Charles Spurgeon said, 
this is, I will end, end my uh, sermon right here. The child of God works not for life, but from life. He does not work to be saved. He works because he is saved. Y'all pray with me. Heavenly Father, I, I just thank you for your word. And Father, I covered a lot of territory today out of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and some of the, uh, the people that I brought up and called by name as they talked about temptations and trials. And Father, as uh, the, head, the head of the uh, sermon, uh, uh, Trials and Tribulation and What's Next, Father, open our minds and our hearts to your word as, as we go into the next trials and tribulations that we can be prepared. And as we live through these trials and temptations, strengthen us in a way that when the next one comes, we will have a little joy in us knowing that you're doing it for a reason. And out of that reason, we will understand in the future why we went through it. Father, I ask your blessings on each person that's here. I thank them for their... Uh, uh, listening abilities and uh, for the congregation that's here I ask your continued blessings on them and Father we'll give you the praise and the glory for all of it in Jesus name Amen you bet now I'm going to close the service <laughs> I want to thank all of y'all for coming I thank you for your attention uh, the last time, the last time I got to preach, uh, it's in my notebook there. It's been a while back. Uh, I don't get the opportunity much. I'm like Sam Feather. You know, when we get the opportunity, we take advantage of it. I want to thank the congregation. I want to thank the elders and uh, Casey for giving me the opportunity to stand before you and, and let you hear and see some of the things that, that as I read the Bible, what I see. And, and, and I do Promise Keepers on Monday morning. I do Gideons on Saturday morning. And I do G2 groups on Sunday morning. I used to do Awanas on uh, Wednesday evenings. Uh, and out of all of those, I sure enjoy reading the Bible. I read it every morning, and I encourage you to read it every morning. I encourage you to, to go beyond just what the Word says. Be silent and, and look into the footnotes on there. Go to different resources. And try to understand what God is trying to tell you at the time that you're reading whatever you're reading. That's all I have today. If, if, uh, if anybody in here does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, uh, I will be here for a little while. I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Uh, there are some elders and uh, deacons and a lot of folks in this room right here that would be more than happy to talk with you all. I encourage you to, uh, uh, to ask them to help you to to walk you through uh, what Christians do today and uh, the love of Jesus Christ awaits you. So with that, I'll close us and we'll be able to dismiss. Father, I thank you for your word again. I thank you for each person that's here. And Lord, I pray for those that, that are searching for something that they don't know what they're searching for. But Father, I ask that through your Holy Spirit that you would spark that inside that person, that they would come forward and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Father, I just ask that as we go forth that you guide us uh, uh, home safe to our different places. I pray for everybody's safety, health, and all the other issues they're going through. And Father, I just pray that I know that what's next you have prepared for us. And I just pray that uh, as those times come that we will search for your word to help us to get through it. And we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.